Uh, some of you may know her husband, Mark Emery. Uh, unfortunately, they arrested him and it was politically motivated. Uh, that was their statement to the judge, the uh, district attorney down there in the States, basically saying if we arrest Mark Emery and lock him up, it's going to put a damper on the uh, marijuana legalization movement. That shows a lot of political motivation. Uh, Jody Emery is his wife. She's also the owner of uh, Cannabis Culture, and uh, she's in charge of Pot TV, I guess, as well. She's, a lot of you know her resume very well. And she's going to talk to you about the human impact of what Prohibition does. I mean, the, the other two gentlemen touched on it as well, but she has a personal experience. And I think it's really important that we do hear what she has to share with us today. Uh, so, Jody, it's all you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, I'd like to point out that I support the Liberals for this uh, resolution, for this purpose, I, but I'll support any party who's willing to say uh, prohibition is a failed policy. So that's, that's my bit, you know, I'll throw my voice behind anyone who is going to follow evidence-based policies and at this point with the statements Bob Ray did say in the House, which Mark really loved reading, um, we have a leader actually taking a stand that, you're right, it's very hard to backtrack from that sort of comment, so that's exciting. But I, I agree with everything that's been said, obviously. Prohibition is proven to be a failure and we know that there's all the evidence to prove that. And we also know, I found the marijuana activist hat right now, I'll put that on. If Mark was here, he'd say marijuana is good for people, marijuana saves lives, cannabis is used medicinally, and it saves people's lives. It doesn't just help people who are sick and dying and suffering. It helps them bring relief, but it also helps healthy people prevent illness and prevent stress. And stress is a killer, everybody knows that. So if you can have something that reduces your stress level, be it exercise or a cup of coffee in the morning or maybe a joint every night, then why should anybody reduce years from your life by depriving you of what could extend your life by keeping you healthy and happy? So marijuana is good for people and that's one of the reasons we need to legalize it. And that's been the call of many pot actors for a long time. Um, you know, of course my husband and many others have been saying marijuana is good and needs to be legal and prohibition is a policy that has failed. But we now have huge numbers of support on our side. We've got the health officers, we've got former attorneys general, we've got law enforcement, we've got everybody out there who's not even pro-pot, but who is just pro-logic and pro-compassion saying, all right, we need to change this policy because it is destroying lives and it's costing a fortune we can't afford and it's not having an impact. But that might make you question, as it makes me question, if the stated goals of prohibition are not being met, which is to reduce use and to stop the gangs and to keep the children safe, what goals are being met? Well, there's a lot of people who make a lot of money, and we know gangs make a lot of money, but we also know police budgets never get cut. They always get increased, whereas education and healthcare, they suffer cuts. Other areas suffer cuts. Law enforcement doesn't. Court costs, 70% of BC's court time and resources are used for drug offenses. That's a huge amount of money, huge amounts of money and time and resources being wasted. And when you have the public complaining that violent people are not being kept behind bars, or that they're not getting dealt with fairly because the court system is so backlogged, get rid of all those possession cases and get rid of all the minor drug offenses and you would be able to deal with the dangerous people who are a threat to society. So when the government says that their goal is to go after the gangs and make the streets and communities safe, they're not going to do that with these policies. In fact, these policies they're pushing are proven to do the opposite. And again, what is the goal then? If, if they're spending so much money repeatedly, despite all the evidence showing it's a waste, then why, why does it continue? And I'd say sure we can lobby the politicians and, and educate them and get them on board and it's very important to get the laws changed and you need politicians and the political process on your side for that. But there's big money involved in marijuana prohibition. There is really big money and not just in the pockets of gangsters and not even just in law enforcement. But right now Canada is facing a threat that I find very worrisome and some people don't 
but I do, and it's the threat of private prisons, private for-profit prisons. In the United States, one of the main reasons we've seen the prison industry grow so much and drug laws not change at all is because we've seen private prison companies lobby to make sure these laws stay in place. In fact, Geo Group, which is one of the biggest international prison companies on the stock market, you can go and see how much their stock is worth uh, if you want to invest in the destruction of lives, that's up to you. But if you check that out with uh, Geo Group, their annual report to shareholders tells them that we're making sure prisons stay at like 98% full. We're making sure that immigration laws and drug laws are made tougher because we can guarantee that prisons will stay full and we're going to keep making money. So when you've got an industry like that where they need to guarantee that people are locked up, once you lock up all the violent people, who else are you going to go after? The nonviolent people. And they've been going after the nonviolent drug offenders forever since the war on drugs began. It's been going after harmless, nonviolent people. And when we're talking about drug prohibition and all the costs uh, in terms of tax dollars and all the harms in terms of health care and all the corruption in terms of law enforcement, there is the human element. We've got a human rights crisis going on with drug prohibition. When I go to visit Mark, I see a huge number of children going to visit their fathers. There are a lot of fathers locked up behind bars. There are a lot of mothers too now as well. A lot of families being pulled apart and children of course I see their parents coming to visit them and you see the sadness in the eyes of these seniors with their canes coming in to visit their son in a medium security prison because he was foolish enough to get involved in maybe the meth trade and he had some meth on him. And this is a medium security prison so there are a lot of drug offenders here. Some of them are violent people, Mark knows a few murderers, but you know, they don't act like murderers all the time. They, they may have committed a crime that was bad, but they are still human beings and many of them regret that. Many people who commit a crime wish that it never happened and wish they could get rehabilitation and wish they could have a chance again back in the real world. But they won't because they're being locked up for 10, 20, 30 years. A lot of these pe people are going to die behind bars at an expensive cost uh, in terms of trying to keep them alive while they're locked up. Um, it's, it's unaffordable on a human rights level because when you see these children going to visit their families and you see the mothers trying to explain that daddy has to go back to work or you know daddy's not a bad man, he just made a bad decision or even in many cases they didn't even make a bad decision. They got caught dealing in pot and nobody was hurt. There were no weapons involved and yet their lives are destroyed. Their children and their wife and their parents and their family. So first of all you have somebody removed from their family and you've got children who are parentless and you've got parents who lose their children. Many of these families, they're even lucky to have a visit once in a while because their family members are placed so far away from them. Their kids might not even ever see them until they're released from prison and they're complete strangers. And that's one of the most heartbreaking things of all. When I see a mother come in with her little child and say, go hug daddy, go hug daddy. And the kid doesn't even know that's their father. And they're scared and they're in this strange environment. And to see those tears in the eyes of the parents and the father when he's reaching out to his kid and the kid won't go to him and he knows he's never going to be in that child's life, that's a, a serious expensive loss um, because not only is that parent going to not be with that child, that child has a much higher likelihood of going into crime themselves. When they're missing that father figure, they're likely to find some sort of other authority or father figure. In many cases, they get into a criminal life because they don't know any better. They haven't had the fatherly guidance there to give them some advice about what to do and make good choices and all that. And, and when they see that their parents are being hurt so bad by law enforcement, they don't trust the police anymore. What do you say to your child when, when their father has been locked up for something that hurt no one? And you have to tell your child that don't be scared of the cop because if you are in danger you need to be able to trust him. What happens when those children grow up and they can't trust the police and bad things are going on around them or they see something happen? That's going to cause harm to others. That causes harm to a greater community. 